welcome all of you here tonight. It's uh, good to have you. Good to have our visitor with us. We welcome those on live stream also who have joined us. This is a time of uh, fellowship as well as of learning when our spirits can be merged together and two or more can be better than one. Your difficulties and challenges can be helped tonight just by being here. We may not address particularly the things that are challenging you, but they will be addressed. Amen. We're in the book of Amos. This will be our 12th lesson in this uh, prophetic word. From one point of view, it's uh, a difficult word because it's about judgment. Mm -hmm. But our generation needs to hear about judgment divine judgment. We we are faced with a sleepy religious yeah. society. The professing church is snoring. It's asleep. It's on the brink of disaster. It doesn't even doesn't even know it. Yeah. So that's why books like Amos are in the Bible. Because that's exactly the condition that Israel was in. Now, as you know, a lot of the way God reasons, and you want to pick up on this, a lot of the way God reasons is made known in his dealings with Israel. They're like an exhibit of how God reacts to favorable responses and unfavorable responses, how he reacts to threats, and how he reacts to advantages among God's people. They were a people that uh, some hard lessons were taught them. That you have reason to thank God you didn't have to learn them the way they did. That's why these things are written, see. These things are written because everything, experience isn't the best teacher. In spite of uh, men saying so. The Holy Spirit's the best teacher. That ought to be evident. We shouldn't have to comment any more about, about that. Now we're learning particularly in this lesson tonight how God reacts to being unthankful. And it's very strong. There are, there are things God just won't tolerate in mankind. And unthankfulness, that's, that's one of them. So we want to learn from his expressions to people that were unthankful, people that forgot. That's something else. God is intolerant of people forgetting what he's done. You will not find him accommodating to this at all. Now, even though these things ought to be evident, there are false teachers in society today that have fabricated a God that really doesn't expect much out of the people. Now, it's a fabricated God. This is not the real God. Be sure about this. The God who made man expects something out of them. He's displeased when he doesn't find it. He's pleased when he finds it. Now these people have taught a God that doesn't expect much. And then they've feigned humility by saying something like, we're really not what we ought to be, but we're trying. You know. And the thought has come across that it's virtuous to know what you ought to do. And somehow, that raises you up a little higher than everybody else. But this is a fable. This is not true at all. To know the will of God and not to do it compounds your problem. Now, Jesus once asked the question, 
and there is no satisfactory answer to it, why do you call me Lord and don't do what I say? You know, you, there is no satisfactory answer to that. But that he asked that type of question today still. So God's people have got to break loose from the spirit of stupor Amen. and sleepiness in the spirit. They've got to get out of that state. And wh whatever causes it has got to be identified and kicked out of their life. This is imperative. Do this now. Men have got to stop living, particularly professed Christian people, today have to stop living without regard to God. This has got to stop instantly. This is not something you phase out. This is something you got to stop now, and if you want to do it bad enough, God will give you grace to do it. That's how, how it works. Now, you'll remember that God, uh, to show you his intolerance with un unthankfulness and not serving God, the Gentile world were noted for their unthankfulness. The first chapter of Romans delineates the subject, and God gave up on it. He gave them over to do whatever they wanted, and they really bottomed out. Then he took the Jews, to whom he'd made known a lot of things, and they were unthankful too. And he wasn't any more tolerant of unthankfulness just because they were his people, because he'd called them and delivered them and aided them and sent prophets to them, gave them a law. Because he did that, didn't make him more tolerant of them being unthankful. He judged them for it too. See, he will not overlook it. Grace really doesn't have to do with overlooking sin. It has to do with empowering people to forsake sin. That's what grace has to do with. So now with great plainness of speech, the prophet's going to continue talking to Israel. Remember, he's, this is a second, second installment on this judgment of Israel. <coughs> Same as uh, 2, verses 9 through 11. Yet destroyed I the Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of the cedars, and he was strong as the oaks, yet I destroyed his fruit from above and his roots from beneath. Also I brought you up from the land of Egypt and led you 40 years to the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorite. And I raised up of your sons for prophets and of your young men for Nazarites. Is it not even thus, O children of Israel, saith the Lord? I mean, is it is true? God said what I just said. All right, let's uh, let's look at this. <laughs> He's going to show Israel that there's no acceptable reason for his decline. Amen. He's not asking why did you decline? Why didn't you remember? He, because there isn't any acceptable answer for that condition. The lack of response, a holy response to God, there is no reason for it, and God's not going to ask you to give one, because there isn't any valid reason for it. And he's not going to say this was just the result of your humanness, you know. You couldn't do it. God, men may say that, but God doesn't say that. God, well, they couldn't do it. That's, it, was too, it was too high. It was too lofty. You don't tell God what you told me to do was too hard. Amen. But there are people, who say, and then they create a theology yeah. that says God knows you can't do it. This is a false to the core. So we've got to carefully follow now his line of reasoning here. He's got a situation in the Israelites that he will not tolerate. He will not accept any excuse for it and he's going to reason with that in mind 
Now, I destroyed the Amorite, he said. You didn't. I did. In other words, say, I sent destruction on the Amorite, or I cast out the Amorite, or I cut off the Amorite, or I cleared the land of the Amorite. The words before them, I destroyed the Amorite before them, means in front of their eyes. I did this right under your nose. You saw me do this. Destroy the Amorite. That's something you personally witnessed. Now, the Amorites were descendants of Canaan, grandson of Noah and son of Ham, who was cursed by God. These Amorites, it was their, it was their iniquity that was not, it didn't reach its fullness, which accounted for a 400-year delay before Israel went into the, the land. God told Abraham, you know, um, your, your descendants will go down to Egypt for 400 years, in bondage for 400 years. They were there 430 years, but the first 30 years was Joseph was there and they weren't in bondage. Because the, the cup of the iniquity of the Amorites isn't full yet. The Amorites aren't as bad as they're going to get. They're going to reach a point where I'm going to kick them out. Now, America needs to hear this. Amen. They need to hear this now. Amen. There had been one people kicked out of this land once. They were idol worshipers. They worshiped the earth. Yeah, right. Just in case somebody forgot. Yeah, uh -huh. They worshiped false gods. Mm -hmm. They were dispossessed of the land. He can kick. He can kick Americans out of it too. The Amorites were the first of the listed nations that occupied Canaan. They were the most prominent body of people in Canaan. Joshua reminded Israel that God brought them quote into the land of the Amorites. So he spoke of them as though they as though they occupied the entire land of Canaan. They, they didn't, but they were the most prominent citizens of the country, and he occupied the high area, high lofty area. It was said of them, and the Lord, this is Joshua 24, 18, and the Lord drove out from before us all the people, even the Amorites, which dwelt in the land. Therefore, we also serve the Lord, for he is our God. So I drove them out so you could serve me in, their, in that land. Amen. Now, these were the most formidable enemies that Israel faced, the Amorites. There weren't the others. There were seven nations bigger than themselves that were in, that, in the country. But by focusing on the greatest enemy, the Amorites, he <laughs> takes in all the lesser enemies, too. Yeah. This is how God works. He, just, he takes the chief of the enemy, and the fact that he destroyed that enemy counts for everything else. Like for Satan was destroyed by that every, everyone that works under Satan, principalities, powers, spirits, wickedness, and high places, rulers of the darkness of the world, they all were defeated because the main one was defeated. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. That means all the other enemies are going to be destroyed too. See, so I'm showing you the logic of how God reasons. He takes the worst enemy, and if he overthrows the worst enemy, there isn't any other enemy that's going to survive. Yeah, that's, right. yeah. that's how God works. If you can receive it now, if God, through his grace, can move you to destroy the worst sin in your life, all the others will go too. The sin that does so easily yeah. beset. See? So you got to know where to apply. Where to apply God's grace. You don't, don't apply God's grace to the little, bit, little bitty things that children should know better. Get the big thing. Overthrow that. And all the lesser things will. It's a king, like a kingdom. Kingdom principle. <clears throat> 
Now, it says of the Amorite, now, <laughs> his height was like the height of the cedars, and he was strong as the oaks. This is a, this is a powerful enemy. This has reference to their appearance. These were the giants that the Israelites saw when they spied out the land, frightened them when they saw them. It is written, Numbers 13, 32. They brought up, this is the unbelieving spies, they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched out unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of a great stature. See, that's what Amos is talking about. And there we saw giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in our own eyes as as sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. Scared them. See, Amos is going to say, but I, but I drove those out. Yeah, those people scared you at first. I, I drove them out. Yeah. Moses reminded the people when they were right on the borders of the land that they said, whither shall we go up? He said, whither shall we go up? Our brethren... Uh, you don't want this to be said of you. Our brethren have discouraged our heart, saying the people is greater and taller than we, the cities are great and walled up to heaven, and moreover, we've seen the sons of the Anakims there. They discouraged our hearts. So don't be all the time talking about your problems, please. Amen. Please. Amen. Don't be telling us about the giants Amen. that you've seen how bad it is, yeah. how you don't know how you're going to make it. That's, what they, that's exactly what they did. Amen. Don't be doing that. Mm. Having said that, see, flesh wants to do this. Yeah, right. Flesh wants to say, you won't believe what happened to me. Uh -huh. yeah. I've never seen something like this so bad as what I've been experiencing. Mm. That's talking about the giants in the land. Now the Am Amorites, we're told, dwelt in the mountains of Canaan, as stated in Numbers 13, 29, Deuteronomy 1, 20. They, they were in a high, gave them the advantage, not only their height, but they were in, a, in the high places, which is also the habitat of the Anakims that were closely related to them. They were a race of giants. Sihon and Og, you remember those? They were giants. They were the kings of the Amorites. <laughs> and they were both giants. Kings of the Amorites. I'm showing the Amorites, they were tall. It's we conclude, therefore, that the Amorites were noted for the giants that were among them. When Israel first spied out the land, they cut a bunch of grapes. Remember? from the brook of Eshcol, which was in Hebron, which was in the mountains. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's where they saw those giants up there. <laughs> you get up in the mountains, mm -hmm. yeah. you begin to see what the enemy's like. Yeah. Yeah. You may think the enemy's like down here in the low, on the plain, on the low flats. You may think those enemies are something. Why do you get up in the mountains? Yeah. See the principalities and powers that are aligned against you, that rule the world. We're not talking about someone that makes you do a bad thing. Rule the world's the world. Yeah. Rulers of the darkness of this world. But God did such a thorough job of getting rid of the Amorites. Remember this were the giants lived in the mountains, nobody could touch them. That it's said of Og, the king of Bashan. For only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of giants. <laughs> That's what kind of job God did. Amen. You had to hunt up a giant. You had to fight Og. He was the last one of this race of giants. I overthrew them. 
You tell in Israel, see, they, they forgot this. Yeah. They told them. Now there's, uh, when the Lord refers to leaving, to destroying somebody, he talks about leaving neither root nor branch. He, any, uh, he just talks about them this way. Leaving neither root nor branch, that's Malachi 4.1 refers to that. It is nothing you can see is left, and no power that sustains it is left. He says, I destroyed his fruit from above. That's what you can see, his conquests, his obvious dominion, his fearful height. He just, I removed what was above. I removed it. Nothing was there that gave any evidence of the Amorite being powerful anymore gone and I destroyed his root from beneath the cause that gave them dominance the prince of the power of the air who ruled them I just I destroyed the root the unseen factors that made them what they were that means they couldn't recover they couldn't rise again that's what you want now you want the branch and the root of transgression cut off Want the branch cut off. That's what sticks under everybody's nose and they can see. That's got to be cut off. Then the power of it, that's got to be, that's got to be cut off. Now there's, of course, application to this is in salvation. The root and the branch approach is, uh, <laughs> he destroys the branch. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. That's, uh, that's the above ground stuff. But he also destroys the root of Satan's power, spoiling principalities and powers, yeah. taking away the stony heart, yeah. 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 making the old, the old age of the old man, bringing in the new man. See, destroyed root and branch. So you can learn. Uh, well, how about it uh, in your own life? Are there things that you had trouble with before you were saved that you still got trouble with? You don't have to answer, but just think it out. Think about the branch and the root being destroyed. <laughs> See, there's salvation. In salvation, both the root and the branch. The evidence and the means are both destroyed in Christ Jesus. So there you are, I got rid of your worst enemies, the biggest enemies, the most prodigious enemies. Then he continues. I remember he just telling what he did first. Tell him, because see, you can't do what you are supposed to do till you know what God's done. Yeah, that's the agenda. First tell them what God did. Yeah. Then tell them what they're to do. See, that's that's the seek, that's the proper sequence. I brought you up from the land of Egypt. Now, according to appearance, it didn't look like God brought them up. If you were uh, broadcasting from CNN, you'd have just seen three, four million people walking out of Egypt with the Egyptians glad to see them go and giving them all kind of gifts, needs. That's what you'd have seen. But God was bringing them out. They just didn't walk out. God brought them out. I imagine a lot of the young children, if their parents didn't tell them, they thought, well, oh, look at there, we're just walking up. I'm sure the night of the Passover, they told the whole family, look, we're coming out tonight. At the midnight hour, we're coming out. We've been in here for, been bondage for 400 years. We're coming out tonight, and they did. But see, when they came out, God brought them. I said, I brought, I brought you out. Now, there's over 80 references in Scripture to Israel's deliverance from Egypt. God declared, I brought you forth from the land of Egypt. You say, why did he say that? Because Israel kept forgetting it. I sent Moses also and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt according to that which I did among them, and afterward, I brought you out. Here's God. This is glorious. Here it is again, 
all the way up into Judges. I were into Judges. I brought up Israel out of Egypt and delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the land, out of the hand of all kingdoms and of them that oppressed you. I did that. I brought you out. How can you account for the difference between your life now and your life before? God brought you out. God brought you out. You just didn't learn a couple of things, a couple of tips to learn how to live. God brought you out. He said again in Micah, or in Jeremiah 11, 4, I brought them forth out of the land of Egypt from the iron furnace. Well, not just a furnace, an iron furnace. I brought you out. I thought not to read this because it might offend the legalists, but then I don't care if the legalists are offended, so I'll read it anyway. This is uh, Micah 6, 4. I brought thee out of the land of Egypt and redeemed thee out of the house of the servants, and I sent before thee Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Amen. I dedicate this to all anti-woman pe people. And Miriam. Amen. It's what, what it says, isn't it? Amen. I mean, she wasn't back in the background someplace. She was out in the foreground. But they forgot this deliverance. Now, God actually instituted the Passover feast so they'd remember this deliverance. And we'll never forget it. It was an unprecedented deliverance. Stephen referred to it when he preached to the Sanhedrin. Paul referred to it in Antioch of the city, Acts 13, 17. Paul referred to it again in 1 Corinthians 10. Jude referred to it in Jude 1 5. See, this is a principle. Yeah. Deliverance. There is no acceptable reason for them to forget that deliverance, Amen. but they did. Amen. They did. If they didn't keep it while they're wandering in the wilderness. Yes, brother. I want to go back briefly to something um, you just went over. When he brought them, he said, I brought you up from the land of Egypt. He brought them into the land, and he, but he didn't just like annihilate the enemies. That's right. They actually, they had to fight. Oh, yes. And he told them, he, he said, drive them out. Yeah, he said, I'll, I'll, I'll deliver them into your hands, but he didn't like turn them into piles of, yeah. of soot or something. <laughs> That's or, right. or, Amen. Like Lot's wife. He didn't, he didn't do that. Amen. So they, they had, they had some work to do, and they failed to do it. That's right. Even mm -hmm. much, much later, the prophets chastised them for not yeah. driving out yeah. all the people of the land. Yeah. King Saul was still fighting That's right. these people. Mm -hmm. David had to fight mm -hmm. the remnants of these people. And God told them, if you don't do this, there'll be thorns yeah, in your, eyes, in your so. side. So you draw a little bit of a principle from oh, that, amen. that God... God does work for his people, but God has a habit of giving his people work to do also. Yes, amen. And I, I think there's a reason for this, a couple of reasons. One is so that his people, as his people are doing God's work, they'll, they'll learn to trust in him. Yes. That was the whole thing with Israel. They were to have faith that God was going to do what he told them he was going to do. And one of the reasons why they got punished with the wandering years is because when they got to Canaan and God told them to go in, they refused to go in because they said the people are too strong. Yeah. That was and, and the, the scripture says that was unbelief. Unbelief. That was unbelief. They didn't trust God. Mm -hmm. The other reason is not only that the people would trust God, but that they'll also enter into his purpose. Yes, amen. God was using the people. He was using the people of Israel. One of the things he was using them for, as you already indicated, was to actually punish the inhabitants of the land. That's right. God was using Israel to bring wrath and punishment on the people of the land because of their iniquity. And, of course, God had a much bigger plan in mind for Israel. But when, when God's people enter into his work, and when they obey him and when they trust him, what actually happens is, is that God's people begin to be conformed yep. to God's will yeah. and desires. This Amen. is what God wants. 
this is what he's always wanted in his people. He wanted a people that would enter into his will and purpose to where the people's will and purpose is the same as God's. Amen. But if you read the scriptures, though, that never happened with Israel. That's right. It, he said they're just, they're, they've been a stiff-necked people from the beginning of God's dealings with them to the end of God's dealings That's with right. them. That's right. That never happened with Israel. But in, in Christ, this is what God is doing. This is, what, this is what he wants to do for his people today. That's part of the provision of the new covenant is that we actually become conformed to the image of his son. Mm -hmm. That's what Amen. it says in Romans 8. Amen. Amen. With all that in mind, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That's the equivalent to drive out the old inhabitants. <laughs> you drive them out. Don't go to a class and learn how to develop better habits. Drive them out. Drive them out. Even if they're in the mountains, drive them out. Now they forgot. But see, about four decades later, the folk of Jericho heard what God did. They, they, were, they knew what God did. Balak, the king of the Moabites, he, he heard what God did. He was... Stephen referred to this unprecedented deliverance when he spoke to the Sanhedrin, Acts 7.36. Paul referred to it. Antioch of Pisidia. Jude referred to it, Jude 1.5. See, they forgot it. Even though they had this Passover, yeah. to remember it, they forgot it. All through the wilderness wandering, they didn't observe the Passover. Yeah. And when they got into the land, then Joshua instituted the Passover. Hezekiah renewed the Passover because they hadn't had one for a long time, many years. Josiah renewed the Passover because it says in Scripture, 2 Kings 23, 21, it hadn't been kept since the days of the judges. See? What I'm saying is when people forget, there's a reason why they forget. A lot of people forget because... They don't partake of this table. Some spiritual midget has told them you got to be careful you don't remember this too often because it'll get common. Well, the Israelites can raise up and say, this is not exactly the truth. Ezra renewed it again after the Babylonian captivity. See, as though, oh, it's no wonder these people had to be reminded, I brought you out. See, they hadn't followed the means that was instituted to remember it. Then he says, now I led you for 40 years through the wilderness. There the faithfulness of God is exhibited again. He led them for 40 years until all the unbelieving men died off, which was about 601,000. I think Brother Gene figured that out. There were sometimes they'd wipe out several thousand of them in some plague, like 23,000 would die, you know, and this sort of thing. But there's a lot of deaths. 40 years, there was a lot of deaths occurred. So I imagine about every day they were burying somebody. There goes another one. I led you. you didn't, they didn't camp any place. They journeyed. Because they were depicting the nature of life in Christ. It's like a journey through a desert. That's, it's, it's like that. So they were living that out. The people who were young when they came out, the people who were born while they were in the wilderness, Joshua and Caleb, they, they gained from the leading. I imagine they told the other people just a little longer. Only 30 years to go. Yeah. See, he told them 40 years. He told them exactly how long. Had one year for every day. One year of punishment for every day disobedience. Oh, some people think it's the other way around. No, it's not the other way around. One year for each day. 
So I know you didn't have to. Joshua and Caleb, they knew that they had a good calendar keeping system, I'm sure. They knew we're, we're, near, we're nearing it now, brethren. Don't, don't fail now. We're getting up there close to the year number 40. Legend for 40 years. Here's how God stated it. Moses speaking for him, the Lord thy God bless thee in all the works of thy hand. Knoweth thy walking through this great wilderness these 40 years. It was a circuit too at this route, you know. Well, God's going through this desert. <laughs> they probably encountered many of the graves along the way. <laughs> remember old so and so, here he is, we're here again. What a, with us this day. what a remembrance that would have been, how, how sobering that would have been Amen. for the ones that, that were getting ready to go in. Mo Moses said again to them, he said, um, The Lord thy God bless thee in all the works of thy hand. He knoweth thy walking through this great wilderness these forty years. Thy God hath been with thee and lacked nothing. Yes, amen. You may not have liked the diet, but you did have one. You may not like what you've been given, but you do have something. Yes, amen. You have something. Fed them with manna so they'd know man lives by every word of God, Moses told them. Stephen spoke of this leading, yes. Acts 7. Paul spoke in a synagogue about it, Acts 13, 18. And again, he mentioned it in his writings in Hebrews about this being led through the wilderness. And I brought you up out of that wilderness, to possess the land of the Amorite. After 40 years, they possessed the land of the Amorite, triumphantly entering and overthrowing Jericho. And finally, by Joshua 18.1, they overthrew the inhabitants of the land, that is their dominion, and they were able to occupy territory, even though they didn't drive out all the inhabitants. I brought you to uh, possess the land of the Amorite. See, he said, before I, I drove them out, I brought you to possess. Now, all these benefits made all backsliding and all lapses of memory and all disobedience inexcusable. Yes, amen. The fact that God did this made all that inexcusable. We don't need anybody explaining to us why people sin and why they can't do better and why they've got a bad family background. they got this quirky gene in them that makes them do stuff. And We don't need those kind of explanations. Send those people home. They have no place in the body of Christ. Send them to the state schools, but get them out of the Christian ones because it, God has made inexcusable. Any lapses of memory, any lack of... A, conformity, it's inexcusable because God's done too much. And the individual, remember Peter makes this, he, he connects this, he says you've forgotten that you That's were purged right. from your old That's sins. Right. That's right. And every time that happens, the, the, the thing that becomes prominent is you begin sinning again. That's right. Yeah. Now you can trace it back, Paul did this, you can trace it back that wherever people decline spiritually mm -hmm. they have at some point they embraced a false gospel yeah, right. at some point that's what happened maybe it was the gospel that said you don't have to believe at all uh -huh. yeah. God will just handle it all for you yeah. so all of this was of course this taking away of excuses was nothing compared to the salvation that's in Christ Jesus yeah. what can be said of those who were once enlightened, have tasted of the heavenly gift, made partakers of the Holy Ghost, have tasted the good word of God, powers of the world to come. What about if they fall away? Here's how serious it is. They can't come back. That's what he says. It's impossible to renew them to repentance. That's what he said. It's impossible. That, that's, that's how serious it is not to be thankful and not to be consistent and not to grow. That's how serious it is. Eventually, you cross over a line where it's a lot, the penalty is a lot worse than wandering for 40 years. It's a lot worse than that. 
Ready. Could you, in, to some extent, compare that to the parable of the seed in the sower, where the seed was spread by the wayside, and birds came and snatched up the seed? And that was like said to be like Satan snatched it from their hearts, that by not giving attention to it, forgetting it is like having something snatched away from you? No. What this was that the word of God will not compete with other influences. The other influences will douse the word of God. That's what he said. They grew up, the thorns and thistles grew up with the seed, and the seed didn't choke them. They choked the seed. So this, in this case, is what induced the forgetfulness was the cares and riches and things of the world diluted, diluted, diluted what they knew of God. So in a sense, they didn't, in a sense, they didn't forget. They, In another sense, they did, I understand, but in a sense, they didn't forget. The other competitive influences nullified the word of God. And I know a lot of people don't believe this. They, they dabble too much in the world. They just, they dabble in it. You can't do this. You can't do this. There may be things of the world that you used to like, and so you keep, you know, some of the old albums and some of the old books and so forth. You, you got to burn that stuff, just as surely as the folk in Ephesus burn their books. You got to get rid of it. Why? Because the word of God will not compete with foreign thoughts. If there's a heart that's not wholehearted, the word of God will not grow in it. Well, so I say it only grows so far. It won't root itself. Be, yes. Something. You can just have it in your home. Now, this is my oh. own conviction. <laughs> you can just have it in your home. It can have an influence. Oh, yes. Yes, sir. It can have a, a, a wicked influence. That's it right. It can hinder you. That's because it's something Satan uses, see. So I, I, uh, I led you through the... Through that wilderness, but now he, now, now he gets down to something that's quite quite uh, challenging to think about. I raised up of your sons for prophets, and of your young men for Nazarites. See, they couldn't say, "Well, you just left us to our devices. We didn't have a chance." No, no. I didn't import some prophets from another country. I raised up prophets from your sons. See? Yeah. See, you can't say you didn't have a chance. Amen. Oh, no, this is how God works. No. The prophets were all Israelites. All of them were. To name a few, Moses, David, Samuel, Nathan, Gad, Ahijah, you don't want to forget him, and Iddo, Oded, Azur, so you don't want to forget prophets like that. Elijah, Elisha, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, and Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Those were all raised up from the Israelite young men. All of them. Being Israelites themselves, they had a concern for Israel. I mean, I can see the reason here. They had a concern for Israel, and they were unquestionably in honor of God, so they lived out right under the nose of the people. You had holy men mm -hmm. declaring a message from God right under the nose of the people. Raise them up from your sons. Elsewhere, the Holy Spirit makes a point of the timeliness of their messages, too. Jeremiah several times says this, Since the day that your fathers came forth out of the land of Egypt unto this day, I have even sent unto you all my servants the prophets daily rising up early and sending them See, at the right time. They already come at the right time. When it was time to repent, opportunity to recover, here comes the prophet. Mm -hmm. Amen. See, so it was inexcusable. See, so this backsliding Israel, this is inexcusable. God not only brought them out of Egypt, he not only led them to the wilderness, he gave them prophets in a timely manner. Now here, here's a, I'm, I'm not done thinking about this one myself, but I'll just give you some preliminary thoughts that I, I raised up Nazarites 
from your young men. I raised up Nazarites from your young men. Some of your young men were Nazarites, one version says. Some of your young men I made separate from myself. He just reached down and he took some young men and made them Nazarites. That's what he said. That's what he said. He made them. Even though the law described Nazarites as something people volunteered for. He said, I made them Nazarites. The law concerning Nazarites is found in the sixth chapter of Numbers. It involved a separation unto the Lord for a period of time. When a person gave themselves wholly to the Lord for some particular purpose, and then there, when the period was over, there was a certain routine they went through. During the time of their separation, or you might say sanctification, there had to be a total abstinence from wine and strong drink. Now we dedicate this to people who say there's nothing wrong with a little wine and strong drink. Well, that's unless you're a Nazarite. I, I say that's unless you're a Nazarite. Or unless your name is John the Baptist. Or unless you're a priest. <laughs> the juice of grapes could not be ingested in any form. You couldn't eat a moist grape, a fresh grape. You couldn't eat a dried grape or a raisin. Everything from the vine, from the kernel to the husk was forbidden. As long as you made this vow to God, this is something God ordained now. Amen. This is what you had to do. You had to stay away from anything that would possibly tempt you or Amen. lure you. And you couldn't cut your hair all through the vow. You couldn't cut your hair. It didn't make any difference if the fashion of the people was, was different. Yeah. You couldn't cut your hair. And the person who took this Nazarite vow couldn't come near a dead body. Even if it was his father or his mother or his brother or his sister, he couldn't go to their funeral. Would God demand something like that? Well, yes, God did demand something like that. Someone died, he even mentioned, even mentioned that someone died suddenly in the presence of a Nazarite. Just a guy keels over dead. Nazarite had to shave his head. On the seventh day of his cleansing, he had to offer a specified sacrifice. When the vow of separation was completed, he was brought to the door of the tabernacle, and sin offerings, peace offerings, and drink offerings were offered. His head was then to be shaved, and the hair that was shaved had to be put in the fire that was under the peace offering. Well, I tell you, if you don't like details, you don't want to get involved with God if you don't like details. And then they had to, they had to present a wave offering to the Lord. That's after you completed your vow. So you went through a whole thing to make a vow. You went through a whole procedure to maintain the vow. And then you concluded the vow. It was a vow to God. Now, there were some lifetime Nazarites. This was like, let's say a husband and a wife agreed to give themselves to prayer and fasting. They abstained from husband and wife relations. Paul covered this in 1 Corinthians 7. Give themselves to prayer and fasting. It is going to, it's assumed that they were going to give themselves to God during that. There's no point to abstaining from something if you don't give yourself to God. There's no, <laughs> there's no point in abstinence. That would be a part, part, a partial period of time. But there were some people, well, all their life they were Nazarites. Uh, Samson, he was a Nazarite for life. Samuel, he was a Nazarite for life. The Rechabites, you know, I've no doubt read of the Rechabites. The Rechabites were offered some wine. And the Rechabites said, oh, our father said we can't have wine. They were Nazarites for life, a whole family, the Rechabites. John the Baptist was a Nazarite for life. As long as he lived, he had to keep the rules that we'd read. 
We assume that at one time Paul took a Nazarite vow for a specific purpose. Acts 18.18 18 says he had a vow was upon him. We assume that it was some, something he was doing for God that didn't allow for worldly involvements. Sometimes there's things you do for God that they don't even allow for, like common. Even common things that are of themselves right, you just got to... You got. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you just have to think about it because there is a time like this. At the advice of James, Paul underwrote the expense of some four men that had taken a vow, and their vow had been completed, and they were going to shave their heads and everything. And so it's a long time after Paul had actually become an apostle. So being a Nazarite, whether for a season or for a lifetime was a serious matter. Like who would volunteer for something like that? Like if you, if you were to lay out these requirements today, yeah. go to the college and say, all right now, all the young people, we gotta tell you what you gotta do if you're gonna make a vow to God. They'd laugh you out of the classroom. Yeah. Uh -huh. Who would volunteer for such a separation? God says, I took some of your young men and yeah. I made them Nazareth. In other words, they had this, to, he awakened the desire That's right. Amen. to do something for God that required all of their life. Right. Hmm? There's still people like this, and people like this that have forfeited a lot of lawful involvements so they could serve the Lord. Now, I've been blessed with a, with a wife that knows this. So she explained to our children why their dad wasn't like the other dads. I didn't neglect my children, but there's some things I just couldn't do. But I had a wife that knew this, knew about this, and explained it to the children, so we never had any trouble with the children not understanding. Matter of fact, one time, one of the children of the fellowship when Benjamin was rather small said something about what their dad did and asked Benjamin what his dad did and he said, well, my dad studies. <laughs> and it convicted the man he said it to. That's on it. There were such a thing as Nazareth. This is this was involved in being a Nazareth. And God said, I took some of your young men. I made them Nazareth. So when you find someone that has voluntarily forfeited some of the rights and privileges of normal life, it's because God took them. Right. You've got to see that. Yep. This is God raising up. There's, the church has to have people like this. Yep. They obviously can't be everybody, but there has to be people like Paul and Timothy and Titus and Silas. And there has to be people like this that do not have competing interests. Amen. Confirmations of God's care for his people, for the church. That, that still is an intriguing verse to me. <laughs> And I raised up of your sons for prophets and of your young men for Nazarites. <laughs> yes. When Jesus came, he told the Jewish people that they had, they had always, always persecuted these people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He've actually pronounced uh, woes yeah, upon that generation. Now that generation that Jesus spoke to rejected the Son of God. And he right. said that all the blood of the prophets from the very mm. beginning mm. was going to come upon that generation because they rejected the ultimate mm -hmm. That's right. man from God, That's the Lord right. himself. But this proves something. This, uh, this tendency, man has a tendency to reject the people God sends to speak mm -hmm. and warn. Oh, yeah. oh, mm -hmm. yes. There's never been a time... When true prophets were popular, no, mm -hmm. and there never will be. The only popular prophets are false prophets. That's right. But this tells you something about human nature. See, mm. we needed more than just a prophet. Mm -hmm. 
didn't he say that of John the Baptist? He said he had more than a prophet. Amen. Moses and the prophets, the Old, the Old Testament scriptures, what we call the Old Testament scriptures, are referred to as by Jesus and the other apostles as the law and the prophets. Mm -hmm. And there's plenty of ethical teaching in the law and the prophets. That's right. And it didn't save anybody. No. Mm -hmm. You know, I appreciate what you're saying there, Brother Jason. That if this were known and accepted today, Every Christian conference would have some of these mm -hmm. wholly devoted people yeah. versus mm -hmm. apparently successful people. Mm -hmm. See, right. this is not known, but some the church needs. Mm -hmm. That's why when Paul said, I didn't have anyone like Timothy mm -hmm. that would naturally yeah. care for your estates. That was like a Nazarite mentality. And God raised him up. God raised Timothy up. And then Paul exhorted him, don't, 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 don't neglect the gift now. Don't, don't neglect the gift you've been given. Yeah, Brother Gunn, I appreciate the, the, the teaching here on the sovereignty of God and how he's, he's in control. And that's what he's telling them. I've been the one behind the scenes that's driving right. this whole thing. That's right. Mm -hmm. I brought you out. Mm -hmm. I led you. I raised up prophets. Yeah. I raised up Nazarites who lived out total submission. Amen. They lived it out yeah. right before your eyes. Right. You know how, how Samuel, he was a, he was a Nazarite. Mm -hmm. How godly a man he was. Yeah. Now after he has told all these things to the people, he squarely says to them, Is it not even thus? Other versions read, is this not true? What I've just said, God talking, what I just said, I brought you out, I led you to the wilderness, I raised up prophets from your sons, I raised up Nazareth from your sons. Now, isn't this so? Why did he say that? Because until you say, Amen, it is so, you will not make any progress. You've got to get to the point where you say, yes, Lord. Amen. What you said is the truth. What you said about delivering me is the truth. What you said about spoiling Satan and plundering principalities and powers, it's the truth. What you said about forgiving my sins, it's the truth. Amen. What you said about sanctifying me is the truth. What you said about giving me the Holy Spirit is the truth. What you said about me having an intercessor in heaven is true. What you said about me having an intercessor within is true. It's all truth, Lord. It's truth until you see that and say that. You will not progress. Amen. Why? Because that's what gives God glory. That's what glorifies God. And uh, I express my appreciation for Amos. Because his was not like a popular and uh, satisfying ministry according to appearance. And he was, he was unqualified to be a prophet. He was not a prophet nor the son of a prophet. In fact, he gathered fruit. Mm -hmm. He was a fruit gatherer. So someone said, hey, who, who do you think you are? You should have at least have been in the school of the prophets with the sons of the prophets and during Elisha's day, you see, God raised him up Amen. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. to be a prophet. At any rate, uh, think of this in regard like to your own children, if you have little children. Mm -hmm. Think of the possibilities. God may raise up from your children prophets and prophetesses and people that are wholly devoted to the Lord See, so you live with that possibility in mind. Amen. Yeah. And this, this could very well happen to some of the children that are sitting here now might end up great prophets and yeah. prophetesses. Amen. Men and women of God. Mm -hmm. That's how God does. He raises them up from among. Yeah. He didn't raise them up from the Egyptians. Yeah. 
<clears throat> or the Amorites, or the Canaanites. He raised them up from the Israelites. He's not going to raise up great prophets, great preachers, great gifted men of God. He's not going to raise them up at the state universities. He's going to raise them up from the church, the body of Christ. He's going to raise them up from those people. And if those people are weak, it's least apt to have that lessens the chance that one will be raised up. There were whole generations that didn't have a spokesman for God. Did you, they, were, they were written off generations. They just writ, God just wrote them off. May that not be the case in our time. I think I'll close there. Do any of you have something you'd like to add tonight? Yes, Sister Annie. Considering how you were talking about how the flesh wants to talk about the problems that we have in our life and these sorts of things, and I considered this sermon that we listened to last evening, last night, and this man, I forgot his name, but he was pointing out how when David, when he defeated the lion and the bear, and then he came to the Goliath, how he looked at the, the, this bear and how it seemed great in a physical, from your physical eyes. But then he looked to the Lord, and he was able to look at this bear as being smaller. Mm. He's the Lord, he's so great and powerful. And how we are constantly thinking about our problems that we have in this life, and the burdens that the Lord has placed upon us, then these will become greater and greater and greater, mm -hmm. and the Lord will become seemingly smaller to our eyes. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Brother Jason. Yeah, we, we've talked about this a lot recently, I think, but... God really does hold people accountable for what mm. He's revealed to them. Yes. And the, the scripture the scriptures indicate that God has revealed something to everybody. Mm -hmm. Amen. Everybody, everybody's got something. That doesn't mean everybody's got the same thing. Yeah. But God talks about there in Romans one, you know, about the nations. They knew about God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They knew about God originally, and they chose to forsake that mm. knowledge. Yeah. And so, you know, we're, we're living in a time, like we've said before, we're living in a time when there's an awful lot about God that's been made accessible in our own culture. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people that are ignoring it. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Yes, Sister Bailey? Um, earlier in your message tonight, you said that um, you don't tell God that what he told you to do is too hard. Um, it, it's impossible um, to do what God has told us to do without God himself. It's too, it, it's, it's too hard to do on your own without God. That's right. It is too hard. I mean, you can't do it on your own. And um, it's, that's why it's so wrong today when people, t when people say they can't do it. People who claim to be in the Lord say that they can't do it. That's, that's not right because with God all things are possible. That's right. And so um, when you're in the Lord, um, it is possible to do what the world may see as impossible. Uh -huh. Amen. Yeah, Amen. that's right. Tara? Um, children, uh, uh, children can grow up to be woman and man of God. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. Amen. That's right. Yes, Brother Brett. I'm still kind of thinking about this, but I really appreciate what you had to say about focusing on ridding yourself of the main sin in your life, mm -hmm. whatever that is. The implications of, of, of the way you stated that are uh, really far-reaching. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's a lot of practical applications to that. There, you know, it's the same principle. There's a lot of things in life that if you don't if you don't address the root uh, problem, yeah. then you are never going to really address the problem at all, mm -hmm. because right. it's going to continue to propagate. That's right. Amen. Yeah. Yes, I'm. I appreciate you seeing that. Mm -hmm. I wondered whether I had stated it clearly enough, but. But it is, uh, you can work on little, if there is such a thing as a little bitty sin, <laughs> you can work on them like losing your temper or, you know. But that's not the root problem. Speaking hastily, 
That's not the root. See, that's springing from a deeper well. And if you get rid of that deeper well, the other things that emanated from it, they go also. Yeah. Yes, Sister Barbara. And I was considering this point of the enemies in the mountain, how they're larger there. <laughs> But I also remember what they gathered from that mountain. Oh, yeah. But that was where they, they gathered the grapes of Eshel. That's right. Amen. 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 The cluster that was so big, it took two men to carry yeah. on the pole. And, and making the parallel here is we have ascended up higher, going up into these mountains. So when the enemies seem to be larger, then it's because we've made some progress. Amen. But we are in an environment where the Lord gives an abundant provision as well Amen. to nourish and to strengthen so we can overcome those Amen. larger enemies and continue on upward mm -hmm. in our lives. Amen. Yeah. Yes, I thought about the Israelites now. They cr they were corrupted themselves because they brought along the idols with them That's along right. the way. If you were to ask them, they said, about the idols, we don't worship them. Yeah. But you know, they're made out of solid gold. Yeah. <laughs> and, and we just keep them. Yeah, that's right. You know? They just couldn't turn loose of them yet, so we just kind of keep them around. Yeah. But see, it, it uh, actually corrupted them just <laughs> having them that's in their right. possession, see. Yeah. Amos is going to bring that up, going to oh. tell them about, the, about them carrying these gods through the wilderness <laughs> while they were being chased. While they were being chastened, they toted these gods around with them. I mean, that's flesh for you. Anyone else tonight? That the idea of focusing on ridding ourselves of peripheral <coughs> sins or the evidence of a poor sin rather than the sin itself it would be kind of like the Israelites going into Canaan and, and tearing down their buildings instead of focusing on getting rid of the Canaanites themselves. That's right. Amen. And, Amen. and also... Uh, yeah. You were talking about um, the Canaanites, and I thought thinking of life in Christ in terms of laws and habits is kind of like trying to live peaceably with the Canaanites. That's right. Amen. But driving them out is what we're told to do. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we'll have a word of closing word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for the greatness of Your salvation, for the fact that You have taken out from among Your people godly leaders and devoted ones that can assist us in the walk of faith. We thank You for this, Father. And we pray that we would have the grace, You give us the grace to recognize these people, give heed to them and encourage them. In Jesus' name, amen.